OCL and welcome to the Cherokee Phoenix Breakdown. I am Tyler Thomas, the executive editor of the Cherokee Phoenix, and I am honored to be joined today by Cherokee Phoenix assistant editor, Will Chavez, as well as Cherokee Nation history and preservation officer, Catherine Gray. Our show today is a bit of a celebration for the Cherokee Phoenix as this month marks the 193rd anniversary of the newspaper. In this episode, we will discuss the birth of the first Native American newspaper in history and how it, how it survived rather daunting circumstances at times to still be informing citizens 193, 193 years later. Mr. Chavez, Ms. Gray, thank you for joining me today. Good to be here. All right, this is a special month for us at the Cherokee Phoenix and really a special month overall for Cherokees everywhere as we reflect on the 193, 193rd anniversary of the newspaper. Miss Gray, let's go back about 200 years in time. Can you give me a synopsis of the era and circumstances within the Cherokee Nation before the Cherokee Phoenix was established in the old land? So the early 19th century is often described as a time of rapid transition for the Cherokee people. Uh, we have the fight for Cherokee lands that begins to intensify um, and Cherokees are responding to this and have various opinions on how to deal with the American occupation here. So uh, Cherokee were forced to cede vast amounts of land after the American Revolution. You have Cherokees leaving the old nation and moving west to escape encroachment um, of the white settlers. The social and cultural adaptations that are rapidly happening um, during the turn of the century are honestly truly remarkable. Um, religion and the establishment of missions, Cherokee shifting to a more nuclear household, um, mostly due to a, um, uh, intermarriage, there's a division of class that begins to occur um, and emerge within the Cherokee people. So Cherokees begin engaging in business, um, plantation operations. So you have so much that's going on in this early part of the Cherokee Nation at this time. So it's just a time of what we call rapid adaptation, really. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chavez, as white settlers continue to encroach on the land of the Cherokee people back east, we see in the documentation of history efforts by the Cherokee people to assimilate in order to show its white neighbors that they were not all that different in hopes of not losing their home or part of their lands. Yes, uh, <clears throat> this mostly in Georgia, um, Cherokee people tried to assimilate and, and, and copied their neighbors, their white neighbors. You know, they had business, businesses, uh, built uh, government buildings, uh, had great schools and started planting crops, dressing like the, their white neighbors, all in the effort to uh, to assimilate, assimilate and, and show that uh, you know they they were equals, they belonged where they were, and the newspaper was a part of that. In 1825, the uh, the um, council back then uh, agreed to fund the newspaper. Um, as a part of that assimilation process. So um, I think we, we uh, ended up doing so well assimilating, we outpaced our white neighbors in some ways, especially with our schools um, and probably probably caused uh, some resentment yeah. among our, our neighbors and um, which didn't help the matters with uh, them wanting us to leave. So, um, but it was an assimilation of uh, Part of the assimilation process, the newspaper to uh, to show that uh, we were intelligent and we uh, belonged on our land and we, we wanted to stay there. Yeah, uh, Miss Gray, as Will stated, you know the paper gets established in 1825. Can you kind of go through the process they went through to get the from then to getting the first issue published on February 21st of 1828? Um, well, the first part of this is the, is the Cherokee syllabary and, and its invention, um, which was one of the greatest and most valuable changes that happened for the Cherokees during this time. And um, after Sequoia invented the syllabary, which he had numerous setbacks with that, um, he finally introduces this to the National Council in 1821. And then the syllabary, which opens up widespread educational possibilities, also makes it possible for the uh, tribe to establish a newspaper. And so in 1825, the Cherokee Council pledges 1500 for the purchase of a printing press. Um, the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions had also pledged some assistance. 
And so with the help of Reverend Samuel Wooster, um, the printing office was built at New Echota, which was the newly established Cherokee capital. And um, the position of the editor was offered to Elias Boudinot, um, who was a formerly educated Cherokee. And so when it was published in February of 1828, it also becomes the very first native newspaper and also the first published in a native language. So it had two columns, one for English and one for Cherokee. Okay. And Will might be able to elaborate more on the, because um, there were some issues with typeset. There's so many little um, kind of interesting little stories about even the typeset and where they got it from and how they had to change the syllabary a little bit, even to, to fit with the Cherokee Phoenix and the, um, with the number of types that how they look like English characters today. Yeah. So, well, to that, I know they had to make some changes and they even had to delete one character from Sequoia's original syllabary. Uh, yeah, there, there had to be some modifications for the type to be put on the plate to, uh, to print the newspaper. So <clears throat> that's, and, and those changes stayed, I guess, after all these years, they, because of the, the, the modifications that had to be made back then to, uh, to print the newspaper. Yeah. So the paper's established and they begin printing there in New Echota. Uh, Will, can you tell me about the paper's first editor, Elias Boudinot, and then what kind of purpose did he envision for the Cherokee Phoenix? Um, well, I think like Elias was always thinking ahead, always thinking of ways they could he could show the rest of the world, the rest of the country that uh, we were intelligent people. We uh, well, we were capable as, as anyone else, and so I think he already had a vision of showing that through the newspaper, uh, printing documents, printing uh, his words, the things he wrote, and and then some of the the leadership there, what they wrote, and so <clears throat> I think he already had a vision of doing that, and it was already, as we've already talked about, there was already attempts to pushes off the land in Georgia. And so he, he I think he already had a plan to, to uh, fight that because we had uh, benefactors and uh, supporters in the Northeast and uh, the country. And so he, he would write uh, thinking about them and how they would react to what was going on in Georgia and trying to keep our lands. Um, and so a lot of the, uh, the first three, issues of the paper were devoted to printing the uh, tribe's constitution. And then uh, later issues had news and documents, uh, laws, general news um, about what was going on in, in the Cherokee Nation in the area. Um, customs and traditions of the Cherokee. Of course, you know, the English and Cherokee, all, it was, it was, this is all being printed in English and Cherokee. Mm -hmm. And some, some arts, stories, not very much, but, um, but yeah, I think Abu not had a vision already. I had a plan to, to show that uh, we we were intelligent people. Yeah, Miss Gray. So a year into the operation, they go from the name Cherokee Phoenix to Cherokee Phoenix and the Indian Advocate. What what was the motive behind that name change? Um. So the paper's founding is is rooted in. Cherokee Nation's response from um, to pressure from Georgia and and the surrounding states to relinquish territory. So the Phoenix became one of the best informational tools to keep the people unified and and resistant um, as pressures begin to to mount for their removal. Um, and so the Cherokee Phoenix is also it becomes a tool for gaining support um, among the Americans. And so in 1829 the publication became the Cherokee Phoenix and Indian Advocate to make its efforts um, and publication more explicit on that is, is how my understanding is. Okay. So how did John Ross, uh, I'm sorry, Chief John Ross kind of view the purpose of the newspaper at that time? Um, early on, I think John Ross is very supportive of the newspaper. It was used to print official laws and documents and the constitution like Will stated um, local, international news, um, and so on. And it was also used as a public relations tool that was being shared among the Cherokee allies and American supporters who opposed removal policies. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but the paper's editor, when Elias Boudinot, um, 
started finding himself at odds with Chief Ross, um, who um, he started to support voluntary removal of the Cherokees, um, he was forced to resign. And, you know, it's evident that Ross always viewed the paper as an instrument to promote, to promote the views of the Cherokee Nation and the government. Mm -hmm. um, and at that time, well, at, at, during the whole time during this time, um, that was anti-removal. So once somebody started to print anti-removal, you know, plant those ideas in the reader's head, uh, Ross wanted that, wanted that gone. Okay. So Will, you mentioned, you know, they printed some of the, or printed the constitution there in the first three issues. What kind of other things were commonplace in these early issues of the newspaper? Just like today, political matters, of course, was in the, was in the paper. Um, arts, um, religious passages. Um, Cherokees had adopted uh, religion. Also, a lot of them had. And so that was uh, one of the uh, ways they communicated the religious passages. And the printer was also used to print religious documents or booklets. So um, there was a plan beyond you know, printing the newspaper. They wanted to use it for other printing purposes. Um, uh, manners and customs some some of that was printed in the paper not not much but because mm -hmm. um, some of it was still secretive you know no one but the medicine people didn't want all of that shared yeah um, so it was it was mainly like I said before just the laws the documents current current events current news things like that okay Miss Gray you kind of um, mentioned it briefly on Boudinot and Chief Ross having a difference in opinion and Boudinot being forced to resign. So who followed Boudinot into that role of editor of the newspaper? Um, that would have been Elijah Hicks, who was the brother-in-law to Chief Ross. Okay. And it didn't last too much longer after that. A few years due to financial uh, difficulties, uh, the newspaper began publishing. Um, there, were area, there were times when it wasn't being published at all. Um, long weeks or months, and then um, it was finally ceased in, in 1834, okay. I believe. Will, after that brief hiatus, uh, Chief Ross began trying to revive the paper, and there was plans to move that printing press from New Echota to Red Clay in Tennessee. What happened in that circumstance that prevented that from happening? Yes, just before the forced removal in 1838, Chief Ross you know, had planned to move uh, the press. It's not that far between those two uh, locations, Red Clay and Rio Chota. Of course, by this time, the Georgia government had prevented us from meeting at New Chota, our capital. And so we had to go just across the state line into Red Clay to meet. And so uh, that was part of the chief's thinking, I guess, was to be able to make that, put the press there and then where we could print again. Mm -hmm. But uh, word got out that he was he was planning to do that, and the Georgia Guard, which had been harassing Cherokee people for years, um, it was like a little uh, a militia group uh, showed up and um, took the press and, and burned what they could of it. I guess it was mostly metal, but burned it and threw away the type. Um, if you go to the site today at New Echota, there's type that has been retrieved from the uh, well there next to the print print shop uh, that's on display in the museum there um, but yeah they uh, destroyed the press and there's taught there's a story that Stan Wadey was with the Georgia Guard because he about at this time by this time he and his brother uh, Elias uh, Bunot were, were were part of a so-called treaty party and so uh, they were uh, a faction that were that was against Chief Ross's group or, or advocating to go ahead and leave. But, uh, but yeah, the, the, it was the, the Georgia Guard that took the press and um, destroyed it. And then the paper died there pretty much. Okay. So over the course of 1838 and 1839, Cherokees were, were forcibly removed from their homelands and relocated to Indian Territory or present day Oklahoma. Even though, even through the darkest time of their of our history up to this point, the Cherokee people preserved and quickly reorganized the government and had schools, government buildings, and homes built within five years. 
as part of that reestablishment of the government and society, Chief Ross envisioned the reestablishment of the newspaper as well. Mr. Chavez, what was the process for the tribe to get the newspaper reestablished here in uh, Indian Territory? Uh, well, the, the chief had to go to the council first to to have to uh, request funding, which they they gave funding in 1843 for a new, new newspaper. Um, but the paper didn't actually start being printed until September of 1844 with the uh, William, uh, I'm sorry, uh, William Potter Ross as the editor. Um, but um, the name didn't return, the Cherokee Phoenix name did not return. Uh, it's thought that uh, some historians believe that the name was taken from what was the name of the paper before Cherokee Phoenix and Indian Advocate was shortened just to Cherokee Advocate at this point. And <clears throat> plus, there's also uh, some speculation that um, Chief, Chief Ross didn't want the newspaper associated with Elias Boonot anymore because he had been murdered or assassinated by this time. And, uh, and people, some, uh, he, he just didn't want to some people to martyr uh, but not after because he was the first editor of the paper and and he was uh, he was killed in 1839 after the removal okay. um miss gray uh will um mentioned him briefly but william potter ross comes in and runs the newspaper in the newly established cherokee nation what can you tell me about william potter ross um, so he's the nephew of Principal Chief John Ross, and he was, um, he had attended Princeton University, um, very well educated, um, and he had served in different roles um, for the Cherokee Nation, and so um, he ends up becoming treasurer. Sorry, I'm not sure exactly of his timeline on exactly when he did everything, but he does end up serving um, after the death of Chief Ross in two roles as, as acting Principal Chief, so but he was the nephew of, of um, Principal Chief John Ross at that time. Okay. Mr. Chavez, the paper started and stopped operations several times during the 19th century. What were some of the circumstances that caused that stoppage? Well, just like in the in Georgia, when we, we had the paper, it was a matter of funding most of the time here that made the printing of, printing of the paper inconsistent. Um, it's, between um, 1853 and 1906, it was really sporadic uh, just because of funding. And then um, uh, William Penn Boudinot brought the paper back in 1870. But then in 1875, a fire nearly destroyed the building, which is still in, in Tahlequah, the Capitol building, uh, the Supreme Court building in Tahlequah, downtown Tahlequah, which almost, that's where our printing press was. And it was almost destroyed by fire, but it stopped the paper then. Um, and then, you know, just the editorship was always changed uh, during the 19th century um, until 1906 when, you know, pre preparations for statehood occurred and everything was taken away from us as far as our government and, and what we were, we were able to do. And so the newspaper stopped in 1906 again um, until uh, 1977. Okay. Mr. Gray, as the U.S. government took those steps to suppress the Cherokee Nation government by imposing that Oklahoma statehood on the Cherokee people and other tribal lands, the paper ceased those operations in 1906, as Will said. From a historical perspective, what was this time like for not only the paper, but all Cherokee people? Many of us will call this the Dark Ages of the Cherokee Nation. Um, allotment and Oklahoma statehood I mean, this is a crushing blow to the Cherokee Nation and then also the Cherokee people. Um, you know, aside from the numerous struggles, you know, that we've had to overcome, you know, asserting sovereignty, removal, civil war, um, and so on. But to realize that someday soon you were going to wake up, uh, not in the Cherokee Nation, but in the state of Oklahoma. Um, you know, this loss of a nation, um, and for people like us who feel such pride in being Cherokees, and I imagine this took an emotional toll. Um, 
on many of the Cherokee people at that time. So, um, and then we know after Oklahoma statehood, just the loss of lands that happen um, significantly. Um, and this is just, uh, like I mentioned before, this is, this is a time of dark, the dark ages for the Cherokees. And um, the next few decades after that is just um, really just trying to get services to, to a lot of our people as well and to make sure that they're surviving and, and, and doing okay. So after 70 years, the paper gets reestablished after the government of the Cherokee people gets reconstituted. Mr. Chavez, what can you tell me about the early operations of the Cherokee Advocate? Well, it was a it was a monthly newspaper, and again, it's always a situation where funding is not uh, consistent. Um, there were times between 1977 and 1983 when um, the paper had to stop printing at times, and then um, I'm not sure about staffing at that point, but it was just I'm, I'm sure it affected staffing the the uh, lack of funding, but. After 1983, the newspaper was um, was more it had more of a more support and and printed consistently all the way up to 2000. The Cherokee Advocate did, but yeah, the the, the early years, 77 through the early 80s, was was tough for the newspaper to to uh, print consistently. So in 2000, it gets changed back to the Cherokee Phoenix. Miss Gray, what can you tell me about? Um, the, I'm sorry, see, when the Tribal Council passed the Cherokee Independent Press Act and how significant is that legislation in Cherokee history and Native history? So it's my understanding that this is the first independent press act for a tribal nation to have and um, I believe there are many provisions for free press and constitutions. It's also my understanding that many are prohibited from acting on those because of tribal politics. And so the Cherokee Independent Press Act of 2000, for the first time guaranteed journalists working for the Cherokee Phoenix newspaper, the same rights and privileges um, as non-native journalists who work under freedoms by the first amendment. So this is a huge step once again um, by the Cherokee nation to take this initiative, I believe. Will, um, you're a veteran at the Cherokee Phoenix. You've been here for a number of years. What did it mean to you as a journalist to see the Independent Press Act passed? It meant a lot. I mean, just when I just based or comparing to when I started at the newspaper and to that point, uh, I started in 1994 where the newspaper was still, and it had always been this way actually, even during Chief Ross's time, it was more of a PR um, newspaper. So, um, most of the time we printed a lot of the uh, um, feature stories and things like that, you know, not much hard news, but I think having, having the Free Press Act that after 2000 allowed us to branch out a little more and, and do a few more stories that uh, may have not got, gotten past our editors before, you know, or, or wouldn't have been allowed by the administration. So, um, a lot of people don't know or, or maybe have forgotten by now that we went through what they call a constitutional crisis uh, in 1997 and 1998, uh, where the chief and the count, half the council were at odds. And so the paper at that time was used as a vehicle to help the chief's cause at that point. So to have a free press and not be able to be, not have to be caught up in those kind of situations where we can you know, interview both sides of the issue and and uh, not worry about our jobs was really, it felt really good for me because I, I had been through the 97, 98 situation where we were always fearful for our jobs. Yeah. How has the Cherokee Phoenix evolved in the 21st century from your perspective? I think Cherokees are always innovative. I was going to add to what Catherine said about our free press. We're we were the first native tribe to do that. And other tribes have followed our lead and, and actually used our native press act to, to, to have their own free press for their newspapers. So there's not very many out there. Out of the hundreds of tribes in our country, in our country, there's only maybe a handful of tribal papers that have a free press. And so that's makes you, makes me proud to, to 
show that that shows we're we're innovators. We we're always looking ahead. And so, um, and you know, after we got our free press, we went to a broadsheet newspaper, which is a, a usual newspaper size you see. Um, and then all these years since then, we've been trying to find ways every time, all the time, to to uh, stay on top of technologies. You know, trying to find innovative ways to reach our readers. So we we're, we're always doing that. We we got a website. We've got we're on social media. You know, Facebook, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and we have our own newsletter. And we're we're always just looking for ways to reach our readers better and uh, and give them more better access to us. Ms. Gray, as a historian, what comes to your mind when you read or think about the history and legacy of the Cherokee Phoenix? I mean, to me, it's just another, it's another first that the Cherokee have, um, have done. And I, I feel like Cherokees are uh, continuously setting the bar for Indian country. And, um, you know, we're very proud of that fact. And so it's, um, it's just another thing. I feel like that Cherokees just from you know, pre-contact time memorial up until today, I feel like Cherokees were, were evolving, we're adapting, we're changing, but we're just, you know, consistently trying to, to look at means of, of keeping our people and then also the nation updated on, on what's happening with us. So, um, and you guys do a great job there, so. Is there anything more you'd like to add uh, before we end our virtual round table? I just like to say I'm really proud to to work here and, and I've been here over 25 years now seen a lot of changes I've seen a lot of history uh, good and bad you know it's um, I've met a lot of a lot of great people got to interview a lot of great people <clears throat> and um, it's never a boring job it's always interesting there's always something to do always some someone to talk to so uh, I really <clears throat> think I found my niche when I got this job and I uh, I really enjoy uh, visiting with Cherokee people and uh, telling their stories. That's correct. Now, uh, once again, it's just, um, I'm very proud of the the folks at our paper and, and Will. I've worked on numerous projects with him and he's always done a great job. And I imagine, I mean, I, I can't envision a time in modern day history where Will Chavez is a part of the, the <laughs> Cherokee Phoenix. So um, I'm glad he's still there and still hanging in and, um, you know, all you guys do a great job over there. So you guys make us proud. You do. I mean, it's very, um, you know, I've had t-shirts or jackets or something that said Cherokee Phoenix, and I'm always very proud to, to wear it and represent you guys. And so you guys have definitely made sure that um, you set the bar and, and everybody's proud of the, the Phoenix. So great job. Thank you. We appreciate that. Well, Ms. Gray, Will, thank you for joining me today in discussing the 193rd birthday of the Cherokee Phoenix and its storied history. I also want to thank our audience for watching this episode of the Cherokee Phoenix Breakdown and be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to catch our next episode. What up?